lot of mixed opinions about this year. That's probably because it's quite a mixed bag of films in terms of genre and quality, but ultimately the list of nominees is one I can look at and think, huh, there are some memorable films in there. So the ceremony took place in November of 32 after a whole crazy year of stuff happening. Gandhi went on hunger strike, the recession went worldwide, thanks America, and Los Angeles hosted the Olympic Games, again thanks America. It was also the year in which the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped, and we still don't know what happened to him, and the year that Amelia Earhart completed the first solo crossing of the Atlantic by a woman, and we still don't know what happened to her either, although this is five years before she goes missing. America, keep a better hold of your babies and female pilots, they're going missing all over the place. This time around I watched nine films, and as always they're down in the description below, so if you want to follow me and watch all the Best Picture nominees, plus one more that I've thrown in because it really should have at least been nominated, go check them out. While you're down there, give us a like and subscribe, will ya? Shall I do the traditional YouTuber cringy begging thing? Hey guys, it's your boy Gage here. Drop us a like and a subscribe, smash that like button. I think I think I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. Just... Like I said, it's a mixed bag this year and I've picked out a few I wanted to take a deeper look at because I think they're noteworthy. If you've watched this series up until this point, you'll know that I always talk about the best picture winner from each year, but as for the others, I try to pick out the films that made an impression on me, and if I think I have something new or insightful to say about them. If I don't think I have something to say about a film that you haven't heard before, then I'm not going to talk about it. So let's jump into the first film. The film is, to me, one of the first ever musical rom-coms, and I say that because we've seen previous films that have music and comedy in them, but the comedy in particular is there because every movie has to have a few jokes in it. This film has everything you need for a rom-com. You've got a guy and a girl, one is in a position of power and the other is in that world but not of the other's status. You've got a funny meeting where a comedic misunderstanding takes place that sets off the events of the film, and then you have the fallout during which one of them realises that they do in fact love the other. I'm simplifying it a bit because like a lot of films for this time this movie can be picked apart pretty easily and almost everyone in it comes out of it looking like an asshole. You know what, it's like, it's like Love Actually. Yeah, I said it and I'm not taking it back, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to why later so stick around. It kicks off with Lieutenant Nicolaus von Prehn falling in love with a female musician called Franzi. After seeing her in the crowd during the royal procession, he winks at her, but uh oh, the Princess of Flausentherm thought he was winking at her. I feel like I'm doing like a, a voiceover for the trailer of a wacky 90s comedy. What is Nicky to do when the princess forces him to marry her to avoid an international incident that could lead to war? Find out this summer. In fact, you can find out right now. He marries her. Okay, so now this guy has a wife and a girlfriend, and the running joke, if you can call it that, is that he keeps running away from going to bed with her so that he can go out and see Franzi. What the hell, dude? Just go and have sex with your hot, rich royal wife! Eventually, the princess learns about what he's doing and goes to confront Franzi, causing her to see that the princess does actually really love him. This culminates in one of the other staples of a rom-com, a musical makeover montage! Let me see your underwear. Jazz up your lingerie. The song is called Jazz Up Your Lingerie, and I just cannot think of a better name for it. And I tried, believe me. Here we can see the cutting edge special effects that make this sequence so darn exciting. Fade transition. Fade transition. I do like that they had a full 30 seconds dedicated solely to a shot of them burning her underwear though. You just don't get that in cinema these days. Nobody just burns underwear on an open fire anymore. What's become of this world? But yeah, the makeover works and Nikki now finds his wife attractive and remember, in the 1930s finding someone sexually attractive is the exact same as being in love with them so he's really happy. And the picture fades and activities are implied. Just kidding, I'm gonna sing! Yeah, stay right there darling, I'm just gonna stand out here and sing a song to nobody like a complete madman before I come to bed. This movie definitely succeeded as a comedy, but I feel like I laughed at it rather than with it. Like the part where the princess's father realises she just had her heart broken again, and he's like, would you like a game of chess? Anyway, it's like Love Actually, in the sense that if you watch it once, on the surface you think it's a nice movie about love, and it has a happy ending when in fact it sends out all the wrong messages, and leaves you wondering if any of these characters are actually happier than when the movie began. When desires are revealed... I'm in love. Aren't you a bit young to be in love? There seems to be a whole subgenre of film in which there's one character who is either unattractive or has a bad personality, 
And then near the end of the film, they get a makeover and it solves all their problems and they're suddenly worthy of being loved because they're hot now. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. She was a spoiled brat who couldn't accept he didn't really want her. He was kind of a scumbag who got married because she forced him to, but kept seeing his girlfriend. And his girlfriend... I don't know. I kind of liked her. But hey, it's the 1930s. We can't get rom-coms that send out the right messages today. This poor f*** didn't stand a chance. I'm doing something a little bit different here because the final film is one I know I'm going to get real heated about. So I'm going to get the best picture winner out of the way first. And you know what? I actually quite like this one. It's The Grand Hotel. No, not that one. There we go. Grand Hotel was directed by Edmund Goulding, written by William A. Drake and starring everybody alive in 1932. In fact, it's due to this star-studded lineup and the central theme of glitz and glamour and crime that it's being compared to Ocean's Eleven. Essentially, it's less of a traditional movie and more of a series of vignettes, cutting back and forth that give us each character's story, but the main plot follows a character we mainly just refer to as the Baron, as he tries to steal enough to pay his way. You know what, I just don't have much to say about this film. I think it's pretty... nice? It is, it's a, it's a nice film. I can see why the Academy chose it to win Best Picture. It's safe. And even the critics at the time apparently thought so. They mainly just talked about how good Greta Garbo is, and how nice the cam work is, and what a nice time they had watching it and how nice it is, and that it's nice. Nice. This has got to be the shortest time I've ever spent talking about a Best Picture winner on one of these videos, because there's nothing to say. It's a competent movie. It's, you guessed it, nice. It's set in a hotel, there are some cool characters, there's a bit of thieving going on and love and stuff. I have nothing new to say about it, because there's nothing new to say about it. And I said before I started talking about it that I liked it, and I did! But just because it's an easy watch, it was actually nominated for and won Best Picture, but wasn't nominated for anything else because nothing was spectacular. It was all just nice. Next! The next movie is one I actually loved. Freaks is a 1932 movie directed by Todd Browning and holy shiitake mushrooms. I have so much to say about this that it's insane. But I'm determined not to make this into a 12-hour documentary about one film, so let's just start with this. Freaks was ahead of its time. Even the title is ironic. It might as well be in quotation marks because the purpose of this film isn't to point and laugh at the characters, it's to present them as human beings, and show their day-to-day -day lives as performers in a world in which they're known as freaks, and shunned from mainstream society. If you're thinking that sounds familiar, it is. American Horror Story Season 4 Freak Show borrowed heavily from Freaks, and I can see why. This film is still considered a horror movie in some circles, due to some of the horrific and disturbing scenes in it. And whereas I don't agree that it is a traditional horror movie, there are aspects of the genre woven into it. The plot itself is a story of a trapeze artist named Cleo, who teams up with a strong man by the name of Hercules, both historical names which conjure up images of strength, power, influence and wealth, to cheat Hans, a dwarf performer, out of his inheritance money, but ultimately fails and pays a heavy price for trying to kill the close-knit family of performers, who she severely underestimates. But the messaging of the film isn't as one-dimensional as treating people with disabilities like freaks is bad. It goes way beyond that. The characters are presented not as figures to be pitied, but strong and capable people who can survive and overcome and win over able-bodied people and are actually made stronger by their disabilities and their experiences. It's been pointed out before that the film is a metaphor for the Great Depression, with film critic Melvin Matthews stating that it is essentially a story of the little people, average Americans, versus the big people, the rich and the businessmen. The film makes it clear that the big people, personified by Cleopatra and Hercules, scorn the freaks. Such a disdainful attitude was reflected in the real-life social outlook of some business tycoons during the Depression. This messaging is still relevant today, even more so in fact. In a time when so many people are feeling downtrodden and left behind by the rich and the powerful, this film is a call to action. For me, Freaks is a story of revolution, of throwing off your shackles and overthrowing those who oppress you. The idea of Hercules and Cleo representing oppressors everywhere is cemented in the film's famous dinner party scene, in which the performers welcome Cleo with open arms, even performing a ceremony, and chanting the now iconic Goobble Gobble One of Us song. Gobble, 
This is a woman who is trying to kill someone she is pretending to love, and if she can successfully maintain her cover and complete that task by poisoning him, she will make away with a huge sum of money. The stakes could not be higher for her, but she blows all of it because just like every other oppressor out there, whether it be rich oligarchs, governments, huge international companies, white supremacists, homophobes, or whoever else, the thing that they hate and fear the most is the idea that they are in any way like those that they are oppressing. They believe that they are so superior, so much smarter, so much better, and so much more important than them, that to hear them chant one of us at her over and over offends her to her core, causing her to launch into a tirade to try to maintain her illusion that in comparison to her, they are nothing but insects. She could have been rich beyond her wildest dreams, but she couldn't hold back her disgust at being welcomed into a group that she felt was so far beneath her. One last thing I want to point out about the variety of characters is that it includes an intersex person named Josephine Joseph. Ah, just as they are represented on the banners, you will see them on the inside. Living, breathing monstrosity. Josephine Joseph, half woman, half man. I want to speak directly here to all the people who come out with such classics as there was none of this PC work garbage about there being more than two genders in my day, and... There are men and there are women, and that's it. 1932. 1932. Here we have an intersex person in a film shown across the world. A real person, just like everybody else who was in this film, who had real condition. Most Americans are repelled by the mere notion of homosexuality. The CBS News survey shows that two out of three Americans look upon homosexuals with disgust, discomfort, or fear. Yes. Back in your day, and even before your day, you had gay people, and trans people, and intersex people, and non-binary people. The only reason you're hearing so much about them today is because they finally have a voice because you're no longer shipping them off to mental asylums, or freak shows, or forcing them to live secret lives or hide who they are completely, so that they're out of sight and out of danger, because however much you like to romanticise the past as a time when men were men, and people had more grit, the general public back then were offended by almost everything. Any hint of sex on their screens, the sight of anybody deemed abnormal. Women would faint if you said a swear word. Men would become outraged if you called them a name. For all the time you spend calling the current young generation snowflakes, spare a thought for your grandparents or great-grandparents who would literally sit down and write an entire letter to the TV station about how they were so upset that they saw a glimpse of a breast on TV or had a suspicion that someone might be gay and that somehow that was destroying the country. Decent-minded people are fed up. People say they write and write, and the same thing happens all over again. One lady, after a dirty play, was so angry that although it was late, she wrote to the BBC and told them what she thought. She said she felt that those in authority should be given the sack and some decent-minded people put in their place. I'll get onto the people I want to thank at the end of the video, like I always do. But for now, I want to say a hearty f*** you to MGM who segregated the cafeterias, making the actors with disabilities eat separately to everyone else so that, and I quote, people could go to eat in the commissary without throwing up. The reviews also make you realise what a horrible time period this was. I actually gathered a few here with me during my research, but I'm not putting them up, no way. I'm not giving that the time of day. There were some positive ones, but still, some of the phrases in there make me so ashamed and saddened that describing human beings in such a way was ever acceptable. The film was actually banned for large periods of time in various places due to the violence and the fact that it featured people with such noticeable and disturbing disabilities so heavily. I'll let you discover for yourself what the violent, ironic punishment for Cleopatra and Hercules received in the end was. It's pretty gruesome and horrifying, but as punishments go, it's pretty fitting. And the idea of rising up against the people who keep you down and meeting out poetic justice like this is one I think a lot of people can sympathise with. Final word, Freaks wasn't even nominated for Best Picture, or anything else in fact, but it should have been the winner hands down. This one is pretty simple. I'd like to thank Todd Browning for making a film that included handicapped people and showed them as capable. 
I also want to thank every handicapped actor in that film. Roscoe Ace, Harry Earls, Daisy Earls, Daisy and Violet Hilton, Schultze, Josephine Joseph, Johnny Eck, Francis O'Connor, Peter Robinson, Olga Roderick, Cuckoo, Prince Randian, Martha Morris, Alvira Snow, Jenny Lee Snow, Elizabeth Green, and Angelo Rosito. You were trailblazers. And as always, I'd like to thank you. Stay safe, and see you next time.